This is Growth Guide, a podcast exploring the depths of curiosity, questioning everything in the name of growth. I'm your host, Brian D'Alessandro. Almost every human civilization since the beginning of time has turned to the sky for answers to life's most persistent questions. Like, what is our place in the universe? Today, we'll demystify the ancient practice of astrology. Now, I'm not talking about simple newspaper horoscopes. We'll look at how the study of the movements and relative positions of celestial bodies is interpreted as having an influence on human affairs and the natural world. Does that still sound a little crazy? Well, think of astrology as a cosmic clock. We're all made up of the same particles that resulted from the Big Bang. That is what's meant when someone says we're all stardust. We are. It's not some woohoo spiritual magic. It's science. It's really a stretch to think that our bodies and planet are affected by huge energetic masses such as the planets and star constellations. For scale, think about the fact that a human, made up mostly of hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, is roughly 62,000 cubic centimeters. The Earth is roughly 1 trillion cubic kilometers, and 1.3 million planet Earths can fit inside of the Sun, a mere average-sized star. So isn't it crazier to think that our planet and our bodies aren't affected by the shift of cosmic positions and energies? Astrology is a subject that was held in the highest regard at least as far back as three or four thousand years. It's a subject that was studied by the Babylonians, Iraqis, ancient Egyptians, Arabs, Greeks, Europeans, and on and on. Until the 17th century, astrology was considered a scholarly tradition, and it helped drive the development of astronomy. It was commonly accepted in political and cultural circles, and some of its concepts were used in other traditional studies such as alchemy, meteorology, and medicine. My next guest shifted how I relate to my life experience and made me feel intensely more connected to my place in the universe. Rebecca Gordon is a renowned New York City astrologer, founder of the 17-year-running school My Path Astrology, and author of Your Body and the Stars from Simon & Schuster. She's the resident astrologer for Harper's Bazaar and has been featured in leading publications such as the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Financial Times, Forbes, Oprah Magazine, Vogue, and television shows like Dr. Oz and CNN, among others. Over the last decade, Rebecca has also been collaborating with top luxury companies such as Chanel, Christian Louboutin, and Agent Provocateur, curating astrological experiences. And most recently, she launched a wellness partnership with the Four Seasons. In Rebecca's client work, it's her mission to align people with their own unique brand of stardust so they can step into their highest potential. My wife and I studied astrology with Rebecca for two years, and it has had a profound impact on how we set our schedules, approach business, relationships, and so much more. It has certainly taught me how to work smarter, not harder. Rebecca has an upcoming free webinar and classes, so be sure to check the links below or on our YouTube channel. This is a really fun and empowering topic, so let's get into it. Hey, Rebecca, so good to see your face. It's been a while. So happy to have you here. Hey, great to see you too, Brian. It has been ages with the pandemic and everything. So good to be back. Yeah, some wild times and probably very apropos to be uh, diving into astrology and uh, helping people to figure some things out and to really be in flow with what's unfolding around us. I think the best place to start is really taking it back because astrology is one of those fields in the west i kind of think of it as yoga how like you know we've gotten so obsessed with just this one style of yoga vinyasa and that becomes the definition of it and in astrology it feels like the newspaper horoscope has become that yet astrology is so steeped in history and knowledge and wisdom and i'd love to bring it back old school to look at uh, its origins i'm so glad you have this intention with astrology because it's true with with Instagram and, and magazine horoscopes that have been the past 40 years, many people think that's all it is. And that's really just the icing on the cake that's only been, you know, since let's say the 1940s or 50s, the, the horoscopes began. And through the thousands and thousands of years prior to that, astrology was life. In other words, imagine a world where 
all uh, no light pollution, every day you would wake up and make observations. Isn't it interesting? Those stars stayed in the same place while those planets moved. And before you knew it, the equinoxes, the solstices, and all of the planetary cycles were mapped out. And then people started to notice things like, isn't it interesting that whenever Jupiter and Venus are there, and this is happening, everyone's having babies? Or isn't it interesting that the hunting is great when those two planets connect on that angle? And patterns were recognized. And then Brian, pa patterns were recognized also with individuals. When individuals are born with these planets here, they become warriors. Or when individuals are born with this kind of sky, with all the planets in air, you know, these are the conceptual thinkers. So it's thousands and thousands of years of, of patterns uh, being explored today. Yeah, as you mentioned, what a lot of people see in astrology is the horoscopes and things like that, which I think are wonderful, by the way. I, I've been a horoscope writer for almost 20 years now, and there's no shame in that. I mean, it's, it's a great kind of gateway into the, the true magnitude of astrology, which is really, it's the language of energy. I always say it's the poetry of life. You know, it can speak about your body. Astrology was used in the Middle Ages. And, and also in the ancient world, really, and how to treat any medical condition. Certain planets connected to certain plants, as they still do. People were uh, diagnosed based on their temperament of earth, air, fire, and water, and their astrology chart way before x-rays. You know, before we had a scalpel, before we had the x-ray, we had the birth chart. We had all of this. So it was really this maps for life. It's also quite amazing you and I are living in a time when they're becoming so democratized and so accessible, really for the first time ever. Mm. And that's very exciting to me. I never thought it would be this democratized when I first started getting into it. It always felt like this very occult, arcane thing we were doing. And uh, to, to see what's happened in the last 20 years has has really been exciting to be a part of and uh, really help this uh, study of the stars grow. And connect Isn't that interesting? It's such a dichotomy. The, uh, the, the same essence that has created this light pollution and has disconnected us from visually uh, relating to the cosmic unfolding is the same technology that has facilitated this connection and widespread access to this information. That's a great point, actually. True, right? It's, it's ironic, right? The technology is, in fact, bringing us back to communion with the heavens. Um, that's, that's the beauty of this time. Just when you said that, just that simple notion that light pollution has disconnected us, and that's such a powerful a note to stop on and for us to each just think of the last time we were in unadulterated nature somewhere that did not have light pollution you have this connection with you look up at the sky and you're just in awe so imagine living under that and those forces really governing what's going on down below because you're in touch with the immense power that they have now that's such a great way to think back to how you strip off all the other technology and the advancements we have access to today and the busyness and distraction and think about the simplicity of being governed by those natural cycles and rhythms. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Now, can you tell us a bit about uh, some of the early ways that astrology was used, how it was used in academia, and because I know that it was one of the highest forms of uh, education as well in some cultures. Absolutely. And, and before we go into that, I want to clarify also that, you know, you, you just mentioned uh, the stars and planets are impacting us. And I, I just want to talk to the listeners right now about how this sort of works, because you know, I don't, the last thing I want is for people to think, oh, Saturn made me do it. Oh, I'm in a Saturn transit. I'm screwed. Oh, Mercury's retrograde. My life's a mess. You know, you really have to get yourself, first of all, into the mindset of a unified field theory versus planets are spirits making me do things. 
Mm. Um, <laughs> so I, I think this is sort of prerequisite to a lot of the things we're going to go into, that there is a unified field, that a lot of the ingredients in the planets are within our bodies too. And everything breathes together. It's all happening concurrently. So when Mars, the planet that rules your blood, that is your blood, right, moves into a different sign, so does the blood flow in your body increase. It's all happening together. Mars did not make you do it, but we're all part of the same wonderful orchestra that's just moving and mutating and creating itself as, as life spirals out exponentially. Mm. And, and that's sort of a lot of why astrology was suppressed through history in various times, like in post-Christian times and things like that, in you know early 100s, 200s, 300s, why it was suppressed is because people start blaming the planets on everything, you know? And uh, you see that in modern astrology too. So just wanted to make that point before we go into the rest. Astrology has a wonderful way of also depersonalizing things to make them personal. Then that makes it so much, somewhat easier to manage when you can see, oh, this thing is happening collectively and this is how I'm experiencing it personally. It contextualizes a lot of what people are going through. Many people say, oh, I feel like I'm not crazy now when I see the astrology and what's going on collectively. There's never been a time in the world where so many people had access to the latest transit, you know, and this is really because of things like Instagram and media and technology that we all have access to this. And what is a transit? Just for anyone who doesn't understand. A transit is... uh, the movement of any planet in the sky, typically in the movement of it where a planet makes an angle to one of your natal planets. So for example, Uranus might conjunct your Mercury and Uranus, which has a very erratic energy would conjunct your Mercury, let's say the planet of communication. You might feel like speaking out in more rebellious ways or have extremely innovative ideas that week, for example. So a transit is how one planet contacts another in your natal chart specifically. Those astrology is a very long history. I mean, if you were like, for example, just to give you an idea, in say the late 1400s in Florence or Bologna, and you went to the top university, after you had studied botany and science and map, and you had uh, studied also to be a doctor, you had all of these degrees under your belt and then there would be astrology because astrology was really the conglomerate of it all. And that say is like the Renaissance, late Renaissance time was really uh, one of the heights of astrology, but there's been many that's called the Neoplatonist revolution, right? And then the prior to that, you know, many of the people we studied through history, like Plato was an astrologer, Aristotle was an astrologer and This is not, of course, what we're taught in school, that these were all astrologers. (laughs) They're called philosophers, you know, in the way that we had been uh, taught, perhaps. But the kind of philosophy they were doing was making sense of the universe. And this was the language of the planets and stars, which is astrology today. And that's what most early religions did. They followed the planets and stars and tried to make sense of the world based on the emanations. And you can imagine yourself in the ancient world, you see the piercing red light of Mars and you just get a sense of what that is about versus the warm incandescent glow of Jupiter versus the dull gray light of Saturn. And when you really connect to these planets, you look at them, you say, "Ah, aha, that that makes sense, the meaning of them now. As I was saying, these patterns were studied in in the Babylonian times, Mesopotamian. I mean, that's some of the earliest astrology. Um, ancient Egyptian astrology, also in India and China, there was astrology happening in the ancient world. We're talking 3000, 4000 BC. And there was really rudimentary forms back then, but we would look at the solstices and ingresses. And when planets moved into new zones that these were noted, eclipses were always noted as times of major reversals. And still to this day, Eclipses are one of the main predictive tools astrologers used. And uh, this has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. So most of astrology back then, as we know it, existed in what's modern day Iraq. Many astrologers came from this place. 
the mathematics of the East were incredibly complex. You know, we had different pockets rising up. There was Mayan astrology that also came from the 900s, you know, and the most of what we know in our tropical Western Zodiac came from what is modern day Iraq now. Now, of course, Alexander the Great's armies invaded Egypt and they took a lot of the astrology, you know, Raven pillage and all of that. And they took a lot of the ancient wisdom, brought it back to Greece. And this is where the actual horoscope, scope of the hour was created as we know it. In Greece, it advanced a lot. Then, of course, it gained more traction from developments in the East. And it kept building and building and building. In the Middle Ages, it was hands down the number one tool. Any, you could not be a physician if you didn't know astrology. And this is what Hippocrates said. And this is common knowledge of the Middle Ages. Every doctor was an astrologer. You had to understand the temperament of the person before prescribing any herb. You needed to know when they fell ill, the moment, all of this was tremendously important. Um, and there was always a moment of times where the church was just trying to bang out astrology and make sure to squash it because it was getting so scared that people are going to become more interested in the planets than they were on Jesus Christ. You know, and that was the biggest fear of the church. So, of course, it went through moments of popularity and sublimation through time. And then, you know, in the 1800s, if we fast forward to that height in the late Renaissance, right, the age of science happened after that. And that's a time when much of the astrology was cast aside, the connection with the world of herbs was cast aside in favor of what we call science. We don't need to dirty ourselves with herbs and look at the planets anymore. We have the age of enlightenment, this thing called science, right? And so many great things came out of that. I like to call it the age of endarkenment <laughs> because it also certain things were toned down. But it's really from that that we're just now healing, I feel, as a culture. Like we're just now realizing how important it is to come back to these roots of astrology and connection with the plant, mineral kingdom, the sky, all of this, how understanding how we are. Uh, what I call is we are an ecosystem connected to all of these other ecosystems. And this is this was life pre-scientific revolution that awareness was in everyone. That's why I see this as and and nothing against you know um, all of our advancements in in science and the medical field. I think it's um, in a lot of ways separate, but we do suffer a collective um, trauma from being disconnected from the natural world. And I think that's the area that we need to work through and heal collectively so that we are in touch with it so that we are able to access it and decide how we want to use it in our lives. I mean, it's not saying we should go back to, to where we were, we're here. And this is great because it's right where we are and we have new tools and technologies that afford things that weren't possible, but how do we then plug these ancient um, tools and knowledge and wisdom into this modern day and age to be even more connected than ever before. Yes, and it's absolutely possible. I mean, that's what I think is the beauty of this time that we're in. It's like, well, I saw a bigger rise in astrology than ever before in, in like the last, let's say, five to eight years. And I think when things unfortunately start to go really wrong on the planet, you know, you have climate change and we had all of these other um, extreme rises in fascism and things like that across the globe. It makes people question, hmm, what's going on? Is there any reason to this madness? Perhaps that was a part of the rise in interest. And then astrology really does show patterns. And, you know, for example, what's happening now in the world, Brian, like you, you, we see these totalitarian regimes taking over across the globe and this rise in fascism and it's it's part of a cycle and i don't just want to say the history repeats itself because it's more than that when you know astrology you can see well the last time this planet was here yes that is when there was nazi germany takeovers when uranus was in taurus last then the last time before that uranus was in taurus a similar fascist regime Okay, so then we can see 
what can we learn from this? I think the question is, yes, Uranus is the planet of change and revolution in the sign of Taurus, which is our safety. People are feeling threatened during these times and they want to hold tight to what they know. This relates to systems as well. What do you mean by that? Like our, you know, governing systems, our underlying systems. Absolutely. You know, when we get to the outer planets like Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, they rule these meta cycles of time. And so Uranus takes uh, 84 years to move around the chart. So when it's in the sign of Taurus, we start to see, for example, these patterns arise. But what can we learn from that is still the question. Like, does that mean that we need to just be reactive and do the same thing it's happened every time? Right, or, or throw up our hands and expect that it's going to be the same. You know, I, it makes me think of, I'm a visual uh, thinker, and so it makes me think of, have you, I know you have, everyone listening, if you haven't seen the uh, model of our solar system, in school we were taught that the sun is here and the planets are rotating, you know, around it in orbit, and then uh, you see this model of how it actually is with the sun moving through the universe and all of our planets then um, in orbit around the sun. And then all of a sudden, instead of this flat concentric spinning, you have this corkscrew. And so it's that same idea that while we're seeing the same cycle of this looping, it's actually a spiral that's moving through space and time. Exactly, exactly. That's the beauty of this. We're always in a brand new space in the sky and every space in the sky has brand new wisdom. There's new intelligence in every new space. So yes, it's not like, oh, here we go again. No, we're never in the same place. For example, I think the bigger question now is how can we not like also fall into those cycles? How can we create the spaciousness within us to not go to that low hanging fruit, to go to that knee-jerk reaction that of fear that these mm. polarizing times can be pulling at which is certainly the tendency right now with these planetary aspects of polarization fear separation and they're more challenging in that way of course these times are more challenging for us these are we can see how people have reacted in the past but and, and this is something that we also talk about in the beginners class is that each person is going to react so differently to these times based on their outer planets, their inner planets. For example, some people might be really thriving in this time based on their sky map, and others can feel like the entire world is out to get them, very sublimated. I always try to be solutions-based with this, so looking at the chart and seeing how, how you might work with these times, Brian, might be extremely different, you know, than... than me or my neighbor uh, based on our charts and how the sky is now. So, so essentially there's two things. There's you and then there's the weather and how you react to the astrological weather is everything. And you could see why in a field like medicine, it was really vital and, and valuable to look at somebody's chart to understand their individual um, composition and what they might have um, a weakness to and so on. So it just makes total sense. You mentioned the uh, your uh, astrology class and I just wanna note that uh, my wife Nava and I both studied with you for about two years. Um, we did two different courses over that time and it completely changed how we relate to each other, ourselves and just the larger unfolding at play. So. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of, of the work you do and, and how empowering it is to learn these tools. I'm all about developing and gaining new tools to be able to apply and, and do better in my life and, and, and feel better, uh, you know, in my life. So uh, I think this is a wonderful tool to jump into there. Now, since we're going to have a bunch of people listening that have not been exposed to astrology, you've referenced the chart. Can you zoom out a little bit and just give us the idea of, um, you know, the chart as an overview and, and our, you know, we always hear, or we typically in astrology, people say, all right, what's your sun, your moon, and your rising. Can you give us what the three of those are? Absolutely. So when you look at an astrology chart on the computer or any app, you probably see something that looks like a donut, which is completely not how the sky looks at all. 
you know, obviously the sky is not that, it's, it's very 3D. Uh, so essentially the, your astrological chart is a snapshot of the sky when you're born. It shows what's above the horizon and what is below the horizon. Now, the first thing that I like to look at is what is on the east, the most eastern point when you were born, which is known as the ascendant. So what is rising? And that was very important to the Egyptians in their astrology. What is rising? It's sort of like the spirit that's watching over you, your diamond, your, your spirit guide, so to speak. And then the sun sign is clearly what sign the sun is in when you were born. But I don't like to look at the sun, moon, rising like this laundry list of things. <laughs> I like to put them a bit more contextually. So your sun sign is known as your zodiac sign. What sign the sun appeared to be in when you were born? The sun is the what. It's what you do. The rising is the how. It's how you can best do the job of your sun sign. And we can do some fun examples with that if you'd like to, Brian. So we have the what. And then we have the how. And then the moon sign is really what drives us. Um, it's what you need along the way. The moon sign is also probably the most ignored part in Western culture, as we are almost solely focused on our sun sign and our rising sign here. Now in the East, the moon sign takes a lot more priority in the charts, in like say in India, for example. Essentially, if you don't feed your moon sign, you might live a life feeling quite frustrated, unhealthy, and things like that, because it really shows your needs. It also shows your why, why you do what you do. And if we don't know why we do what we do, then there's a huge gap in our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember an analogy you used to use in class. Do you still use it with the car? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I say your rising sign is like your vehicle. You're in, in the beginner's class, we talk about this, how the sun sign is the, let's say it's you know, your hero, your character in the vehicle. The vehicle that you have might be a boat, it might be a spaceship, it might be a car. And the style of that would be your rising sign. It's how you move through reality. And uh, so, for example, if you're rising is say, what is your, what is your rising, Brian? My rising is cancer. Okay. So cancer rising and, and your, would you mind sharing with everybody your sun sign? No, no, no. I'm a uh, Aries sun, cancer rising and moon is Sag, Sagittarius. So I look at that also from an ecology perspective, which we could go into after the ecosystems model, but first Brian, you're an airy sun, right? So this means you are, it's let's do it. Let's go now first. Let's explore to the beyond and beyond. The Aries has the frontiers, energy, um, exploratory, um, risk taker, but measured risks too. Um, there's this sense of instinct as it is the first sign. So instinct is the highest with Aries. So it is sort of like that energy of lighting the match, right? So you all can imagine this sort of Aries, Aries uh, Brian, right? That is in the vehicle, you know, that's like, we're going on a mission, direct pioneering energy. I like to drive fast. <laughs> that makes sense. The Aries is in a Cancerian vehicle. So the way that Brian does his Aries thing in life is not through an Aries method. He's not doing it through fighting or through throwing darts or anything. He's not getting, because that would be really intense. If he was an Aries and Aries rising, it would be a real, he would have just, a, it would be pure warrior spirit. But he is the warrior. But however, the vehicle is one that is of compassion and care and nurturing. So it's saying, I'm going to be this pioneering warrior moving forward in the world, but I'm going to do so through caring for, through others, I'm going to find ways to nurture the public, nurture and take care of people around me. There's truly a more watery uh, emotional sensibility here, if I could say, with a, and, and this uh, vehicle yeah, might I'm be a, a sensitive boat. guy. Yeah, sensitive guy. So maybe you're on a boat. Maybe you have this kind of um, 
maybe this is more like a pirate energy here with the airy sun, you know, going into the unknown seas on the Cancerian boat, right? <laughs> um, but Cancer is about uh, building relationships and listening and things like that. So something like podcasting, talking to people, like this is great for you, where you're relating and doing Cancerian things, having these conversations, helping others in various ways. And the Sagittarius moon, now if Brian ignores the Sagittarius moon, then he might be very unhappy. A Sagittarius moon is what he needs to feel like life feels worth living, that joy, you know, and the moon sign is probably, as I said, the most ignored. Uh, do you like having a Sagittarius moon? I do. Um, I'm, you know, I like the higher learning, the higher uh, education and philosophical aspect of things. Um, you know, I, it, it resonates a lot with me. I would also add that if, if you're not having a life where you can learn new things and explore and travel, whether you're exploring in your mind or where you're exploring across traversing terrain, either way, if, if you don't have that, then there can be a part of you that feels like, well, what is the point? Like, what are we doing here? That is a need. Yeah. So you buy an RV and travel cross country for a few months, <laughs> right? That was an example. Like we weren't able through the pandemic to travel and travel is, you know, deep, deeply connected to my heart. And so I needed to find a way to do that <laughs> because yeah, it wasn't feeling great. True. Aries said, Saj Moon there. Um, so also that's a fire, fire, water signature that you have with fire sun, right? And we look mm -hmm. at the fire moon and then the water rising, which is also a signature of artistry. Fire and water create steam and that's usually a creative energy too. So in my class also, we look at professions and your ecological makeup and what sort of thing that builds into. Yeah, I've found that to, to be very helpful. You know, I've read countless books on uh, personal growth, and there's certainly ones like one comes to mind, Strength Finder, which the, the concept is identifying what you're innately good at, because that's where you should focus more of your energy. It's more natural. That's where it's easier. You can enter that state of flow, and, and it doesn't feel like work because it comes so naturally. And so this has been a great way to tap into that. The other part I'd love to, to touch on is the physical and the parts of the body that are in relationship to each sign, because I think that's really interesting in seeing how our bodies might have strengths and weaknesses and how we can take care of our health. And I know you wrote a book all about this. So, yes, I mean, that's something that I think a lot of astrologers don't speak about when we're having a transit. Of course, it affects, you know, our mind and our emotions, but it's also our physical body. Uh, so like Uranus transits, for example, they amp up the nervous system. When you're under a Uranus transit, you will find it quite hard to sleep at night. That affects the physicality. And each of us, like you and I, have completely different dietary needs, sleep, exercise, everything like that, all based on our chart. And right, that's what a lot of what I wrote the book about is really how to treat your body based on your star chart. Um, essentially from head to toe, every part of the muscular skeletal, skeletal system is ruled also by a different sign. So for example, Aries, which teaches us to begin to start new things, rules the head, which is usually the first out of the womb, right? And then going down the body, Taurus rules the neck, the throat, right? And the throat and the neck can hold up the head. So on one point, it says it gives us stability. You know, it gives our head stability, which is one of the qualities of Taurus, right? But it's also a sign that is known to be quite creative too. And this is an essence where our creativity comes from in the throat chakra as well. We can look at it that way too. And we go down the body, right? The arms and the legs, the arm, the arm, sorry, the arms and the fingers, well, by Gemini, the communication with our hands and arms, versatility, movement. Which I never realized that also, I guess, correlates with the right and left um, parts of the body and hemisphere of the brain. So you have that duality that Gemini is known for, 
That's a great point, actually. I never, I never thought about it that way too, where the right and left. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is fun going down. Keep going because this is really cool. <laughs> I love how complete the system of astrology is, and you know, you can see how it all just ties in. Yeah, it's very elegant in that way. And I mean, we move into the sign of Cancer, which essentially is the chest and the breast, and mm. that is about the exhale and the inhale of life. And this is the point of nurturing. And on one level, the sign of cancer can, it's a protective shell. It can hold the energy in, the very soft and mushy insides. It, you know, it can hold them in, um, or, you know, or it can have a healthy balance with the world of expressing emotion. And this is how we give and receive the inhale and exhale with reality. And this is related to the moon mother energy. So all that nurturing just makes perfect sense. Yes. Cancer is feminine related to the moon. Exactly. And a lot of the moon sign, your moon sign relates to the way in which you were nurtured also, and also what you crave in nurturing. And then we move into Leo, which is the heart and the back, the back and the heart. And Leo teaches us to be bright and radiant and luminous uh, in the world. Now, of course, that can also be suppressed. Any part of your body could be experiencing a challenge. And that, you know, in, our, in my book, I teach you how to work with that through exercises and mantras. And what does that mean if I have a shoulder ache or um, there is a heart problem or something like that? So Leo is the heart, which is essentially the center of the solar system. See, you are absolutely the universe. The heart beats the, the blood through your body as the sun brings life to our solar system. So your body is in fact exactly a replica of the solar system. As above, so below. Completely. That is Leo, the center. And then we go into the sign of Virgo, which is the abdomen and the small intestines, which is the lessons of assimilation, discrimination. What do we need? What don't we need? As Virgo teaches that purity of purpose, organization, sussing out you know, the wheat from the chaff, what is necessary, what, what is not. So, you know, if somebody is in an environment of chaos and they aren't able to differentiate, this can also show, for example, somebody might have, say, um, a, a digestive problem that could be so simple. And an ancient astrologer would have asked, like a holistic doctor would say, tell me about what's going on in your life, you know? And the question would be, what are we letting into our world? where we're not discriminating and having strong enough boundaries, if that makes mm. sense. And that could be mental, emotional, physical, as in food, right? It could be on any level. Completely. Yes. Libra is perhaps the most obvious as that connects to the low back. And often uh, when somebody has a low back ache, you know, the question is where have they been literally bending over backwards too much in their life? And that tends to show up readily in low back and kidney issues with uh, people with a lot of Libra energy if it's, if it's out of balance, right? And that teaches us about balance and how to be able to give, but also to fill your own cup and to not neglect yourself. But it is the sign of relationships and giving back as well, to have a healthy relationship to giving as the kidneys balance the body and the low back as well as where the kidneys live. Then we go into the sign of Scorpio, which is where we release and also create life. Uh, so this is the genitals. And this is sort of the area of power, creation, destruction. Now, with any of these regions, again, you see, uh, you might not have that sign represented in you at all in your birth chart. But you might say, oh, I, I need more of that headstrong Aries energy or I need more of that creative Scorpio, the destruction energy to move on, that Scorpionic energy. But on the, the other side of this, Scorpio, if it's not, not functioning well, can hold on tightly to what it knows, right? And not let things go, become like a hoarder. Um, and that's sort of the body just holding on and not moving, not processing. Sagittarius relates to mobility in the hips as the hips help us walk and move and be free in the world. I've seen family lineage charts where there were hip issues that were sort of passed down from generation to generation and also concurrent stories of um, 
challenges around breaking free and being under other sublimation and things like that, emotionally, psychologically running through those families with the hip issues too. I think it's really, really incredible how we do see these lineage signatures uh, through our family trees with similar signs and and makeups. I mean, I know I, I've studied my family and some others, and there are all of these correlations or these kind of threads of different um, relatives who were in that same signature. And you start seeing some really distinct similarities. And it just like, it just makes you go like, okay, there's something there. I can't quite articulate all of it. But you know, this uh, lineage stuff is is real. It absolutely is. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love studying family charts. Actually, it's one of my favorite things to do, because you just see patterns and patterns. You know, we inherit all these features, but we also inherit parts of the chart for sure. Mm. Okay, so Capricorn is the knees and the knees are about structure and your ability to, it's, it's really also ruling your entire skeletal system, but primarily the knees. What happens here, you're notice that you know how the hip and the knees are connected. When we put too much pressure on ourselves in life, when we try to do too many things or manage too much or climb too fast to, to the top of the mountain, carry too much weight in our backpacks the knees take the brunt of it and the knees speak to where we've put too much pressure on ourselves often the so sign of capricorn rules responsibility and service and duty and getting things done all of that now of course that is the role of the knees that hold up the body that keep us strong that keep us there that must be supported but also you see a lot of knee issues happen when we've literally just put too much pressure on ourselves, too much Capricorn energy. Following the knees is the angles. The angles are ruled by the sign Aquarius. And this is our ability to create, to stand on our own, to believe in ourselves and to be upheld by that individuality. So to, and this is a very interesting sign, it's opposite to Leo. So it's seeing yourself also as a part of the collective um, the ankles keep us stable in our own beliefs in our own sovereignty our strength individually to be one in the collective to see yourself as living a life that is not simply egoic there's a greater purpose here and maybe you are part of something that's moving towards a greater mission and this sort of ideal resonates in the ankles, which hold you and balance you, like you can balance on one foot with strong ankles for that belief. And we move into the feet, which all organs of the body resonate in the bottom of the feet. And that is the sign of Pisces, the last sign of the zodiac. And the feet, as I said, connect to everything. Um, they can pick up on everything. They soak in it all. They feel the earth. It's really where our spirit bodies meet the material realm. And this is the sign of Pisces, our ability to transcend spirit into matter and matter into spirit. Um, Pisces teaches us. So if there's like warts on your feet or bunions on your feet or things happening to your feet, you always want to take note and see where is your trust or your faith or your connection to spirit? How is that faring at that moment? I love it. Thank you for sharing that mapping. And that's, of course, only one layer of it. But um, before I, I brought us down this tangent, you were starting to talk about um, knowing yourself and knowing the weather. So can we go back through those? Because I think these are the two most like empowering concepts for how to apply astrology in our day to day lives. Absolutely. Knowing yourself is key because then you can make better decisions of what sort of career, what sort of relationships, what sort of health routines are good for you. And like we have access to our astrological charts, which are essentially a, a map of it's our cosmic DNA. And I, you know, help people all the time choose careers and all sorts of things based on what's in their natal charts. So I think that it's an amazing indicator for paths that will be full of ease, but not to say that it's not good to go outside of the map a bit and try other things like that's great as well. The chart really does give you a beautiful roadmap and even the kind of relationships that you do well with 
the sorts of lifestyle and routines that your body needs, which is so different for each person. So when you know that, when you know your natal chart, uh, you can simply make better decisions in life for you. And that's something I teach in the beginner's class, which is a complete journey of how to read the birth chart. What we also teach is about the transits, the weather, like what is going on today and what does that mean? It's rainy. Do you want to go out with an umbrella or it's sunny or it's snowing? Knowing the weather is key. It's knowing the patterns of life. Essentially, it's about being moving with the current versus upstream against it. And I'm a huge proponent of just knowing the pattern and becoming one with the pattern that is, but also not reacting to it. So it gives you, I feel like astrology gives us this amazing spaciousness between what's happening and how we can work with it and play with it. And I like to say dance with it. I mean, most people come in in for a reading when the weather in their chart, when they're going through a transit that is somewhat tumultuous. They're they're mostly saying, I what's astrology? I think I need a reading now because there's something unexplainable happening in their life. And then as soon as I open their chart, I say, ah, they're going through Pluto transit or Uranus or Neptune. It's often one of these. And then you see that transit's not only going to be with them for a month, it's actually maybe for two years on and off. Now, if somebody's not looking at astrology, they could see these circumstances as just really just freaking annoying and inconvenient. Like, why does this keep happening and messing with my plans to do this specific job? And astrology really teaches us that there's a, a teacher. When a transit comes into your life, it's as if somebody's, not, somebody's knocking on the door and saying, will you let me in? I, I'm going to live with you for a couple of years. And of course, your first reaction is like, no way. Who are you? Let me. So we, we want to board up the doors. And then the transit, the planet, usually it makes, I say, three coats of paint, five coats of paint. It goes back and forth over your natal planet, anywhere from a year to three years often. And it's going to work on you. And it's your choice at that point, whether you open the door and you work with the energy. You say, okay, let's dance. Or you keep closing it. And that is the way those go. Now, when you see an astrologer, like what I try to do is give my clients understanding and meaning of what that transit is really there for. Like Uranus, somebody's going through this. I can never sleep at night. I'm taking all these sleeping meds and doing this or that. Well, maybe it doesn't want you to sleep right now. Maybe there's some magic. There's some genius. This wants you to actually get out of bed and write, you know? And on the other side of that is freedom, you know? Often under these uh, sort of tumultuous weather in the sky, we can see somebody says, oh, they lost their job or their home or things changed. And the transit shows you, well, why this is happening and how long it lasts. Um, so knowing the weather is so important. In fact, Brian, I don't know how people live without understanding the weather by knowing what are the energies this week or next. I mean, it really... I helps you to plan your days out even of the month. Like, okay, I'd like to focus on that. Like today's a new moon, you know? And we are starting fresh, you know? We are not ending things. We are starting new things here. So, and these are cycles that people have run their lives by for, for thousands of years because it really puts you into harmony with nature. I like to think of it as this cosmic clock. And the same way that my body intuitively knows what hour in the day it is, um, it now knows, I mean, certainly month by month, you know, what the sun sign is, but also like the moons, that's another one, what sign the moon is in, is one that I've related to the signatures and, and certain signs more than others. But I know when it shifts into a certain sign, like if it shifts into Virgo, all right, it's time to, you know, focus and get some work done. And, and it's a very easy time for me to be productive and get those smaller tasks that I might've been putting off yet. You know, like when it's in Aries, I know it's time to just go out and like do stuff like, and I'm just, I need to focus my energy or else I'm just going to be, you know, spinning around in circles. So it's, you know, and then when it's in cancer, it's like, okay, it's going to be a very uh, emotional time and uh, things around me are going to be pretty wacky. So don't engage in, in too many 
you know, conversations that are too emotional or succumb to that. And, and just being able to recognize that has given me a lot of comfort, you know, in times where it would be very frustrating or confusing, I at least recognize, ah, okay, there's something bigger unfolding here. So let's shift my, my focus to a way that it'll be productive. And then at other times just allows me to be so much more productive by tapping in, like you said before, into the flow of the river instead of fighting that current and trying to do something that um, is against the larger unfolding. Yeah, that's so wonderful to hear. You're really connecting to the daily moon sign too. And it changes every two and a half days. So it's a wonderful way to, to look at your month ahead. I, I do that too. I mean, and that's a lot of what we teach in astrology for entrepreneurs also and beginners too, is really okay, what does it mean as the moon moves through each sign of the zodiac? And and also the wonderful thing is as it moves through each sign, it moves through your entire chart in a month. So every month there's a remembrance of who you are as the moon wakes up each planet as it goes around your wheel. And I believe that in times of transit are times when we can open up more of the potential within us and our own neuroplasticity saying, okay, it's an opera, it's a tipping point to say, what else can we do with this? What else could this mean? With my clients, I love to use those transits as these sort of tipping points to open up more of our innate potential within. Mm. Yeah, for me, uh, astrology and helping people to connect with it is not about demystifying it just for the sake of getting its history right, but so that it becomes something that people can gain tools from and apply in their daily lives. Can you touch a little bit more on, on how people can use this in their lives? Sure. I, I mean, the, the main two ways are knowing your natal chart and knowing the translates, which are the weather. One easy way, for example, is, as we were saying, to first of all, know where the new moon is and where the full moon is each month and what sign they're in. As the basic thing is that the new moon is opening a doorway for you to begin a cycle of life. And if you act within the glow of a new moon, that will enhance your success. However, not every new moon is a friendly new moon. So some new moons pose more challenges than others. But knowing the new moon cycle, there are still times of opening and times of expansion in the universe. Whereas full moons are times when the energy is just rising to the top and bubbling over the surface. These are times of celebration, culmination, finality, endings, completion. Knowing those two things is really sort of first, I would say. Learning your astrological chart, which is something we teach in the class as well, how to read a birth chart, how to read anybody else's chart, how to read your own. When you know your own chart, you understand the patterns you come from, what you're here to do, how, how you can best navigate the world for thriving, not just surviving, not just getting through the day. It's the, the astrological chart is a wonderful map for, so you can thrive in your own unique way. And I just want to jump in on that one. It's also a lot of fun. Like reading someone's chart is a really fun social activity. Like I can't tell you how many times we've had people over start talking about it. And they're like, oh my God, will you read our chart? And we, you know, download their chart and start looking at it. And it becomes such a fun activity. And you also get to apply your own natural gifts and intuition to it and have your own interpretation. So that's the thing that is always unique to you. So uh, I think it's, you know, a really cool tool to have in the bag. Yes. So there is that. And there is also, as we talked about understanding the weather, which is understanding whether there's a new moon or full moon or a, an important planetary aspect in the sky, like Pluto, say, oppose the sun or, or Uranus uh, trying Neptune, or some major aspect that really demarcates time, understanding what those mean, and uh, how we can dance with them, how we can work with it and allow it to open up more of our own potential. So you learn a lot of the why when you study astrology, why is this happening? <laughs> well, there's actually a larger story here and, and a reason. And if you want to focus on your physical body, for example, you can say, okay, that's working on the kidney system. And you might want to tonify your kidneys. Meanwhile, 
might want to work on those meridians or you know, when they eat certain foods or mantras. So, you know, there's many ways you can approach this or changing your lifestyles, you know, uh, but it does show you what's going on. And I think a lot of people find some solace in the how long it's going to be going on for <laughs> because we all see wow you're under a pluto transit well it begins here and it ends there when you understand these cycles of nature cycles of the chart you see like our calendar system you know is, is based on a solar cycle the sun but like there's calendar systems that are based on venus and mars cycle and based on jupiter saturn cycles so you know, we've just had this really kind of dumbed down Gregorian system, which is only a solar cycle. And that solar cycle calendar that we use, for example, was what the Mayans used to do their taxes. Like that was their like tax calendar where they had a Venus Mars calendar for other things and Jupiter Saturn, many calendars. This is one of many of the cycles. And this is the only one in, in, our, in our light polluted world that we pay a lot of attention to because Perhaps it's just the most obvious. We're not seeing many of the other cycles as prominently. And I encourage my students too to learn the other cycles because when you do focus on the lunar cycle or the Venus Mars cycles, you attune yourself to the more subtle energies that are running through life. And your life changes when you shift your orientation. All right. So speaking of calendars, I know that you have some upcoming uh, events and classes. Do you want to share what those are about? Yes, I do. I have my 17 year running beginners course coming up and a webinar for it uh, right around the corner. So if you're listening, definitely check that out. This course teaches you how to read birth chart, the whole strong foundation in astrology. It'll give you an entire history, how to set up a chart, the entire going through all the planets, signs, houses, what everything means. And uh, we have a certification track available for that course too. So that's coming up as well as a free webinar. So please check it out if you're listening. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I pack these webinars with information. Uh, and I mean, my main goal in teaching all of this is to try to democratize this information. And especially in these webinars, I give everybody the tools that you need to really look at a chart and glean a lot of great information from it, as well as work with the planetary cycles. I think it's so important for us, no matter what, even if there's a lot of light pollution to just get out there and connect with the planets and stars as well. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Such a pleasure having you and thanks for uh, illuminating astrology some more for us. Thanks for joining us this week on Growth Guide. A big thanks to our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Project New You. I'm a huge fan of their Nitrovit nootropic brain supplement. It's helped me to develop laser focus, a better memory recall, and motivation. Nitrovit has helped me in launching this podcast amongst completing many other projects. Visit growthguide.love forward slash focus to learn more and use promo code GROWTH for 15% off. This episode is also sponsored by Morning Man. Live manly, own the morning. I learned about this from UFC champ Frank Shamrock. He was always having trouble getting started in the morning without like seven or eight cups of coffee. No exaggeration, I've seen this in person. So he created this product that's packed full of 45 superfoods and it has 95 milligrams of clean caffeine. So you get that charge from the greens and also get a hit from the caffeine without feeling all jacked up. I'm definitely caffeine sensitive and I like this product because it doesn't make me feel like I'm bouncing off the walls, but I feel sharp and energized to get shit done. Visit growthguide.love forward slash morning man to learn more and use promo code growth for 15% off. I'd also like to thank our sponsor Atmananda Yoga. You guys have got to check out their yoga alignment mat. I've been using this for a long time. As you know by now, I've studied and trained with them as a yoga teacher, and the mat is incredible to deepen your practice and to ensure a lifelong injury-free practice. Visit growthguide.love forward slash alignment for more info or to buy. Be sure to use code GROWTH at checkout for 15% off. Make sure to visit our website, growthguide.love, where you can find freebies, exclusive content, and subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. 
If you found value in listening, I'd really appreciate a rating on iTunes. I can't tell you just how important this is. Or spread the love. Tell your friends, your fam, heck, tell your spirit animals. And follow me on Instagram at growthguide.love. Be sure to tune in next week for our newest episode.